Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, or indeed good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to this webinar on market sentiment. Um, for those of you who haven't been here before, my name is Martin Essex, and I'm an analyst and editor here at Daily FX. Um, I've worked as a financial journalist at places like the Wall Street Journal, I've worked as an economist, and I'm also a trained technical analyst. Um, I trade by mixing fundamentals like economic data and speeches and so on um, with technical analysis and I also look at sentiment and geopolitics. Uh, these are my personal views, not necessarily the views of Daily FX or indeed of our parent company IG. So before we go any further, let me show you a risk disclaimer. If you wouldn't mind having a read of that, I'd be very grateful. And if you have any questions to ask, then please feel free to ask them over the course of this webinar. Um, let's start, as I always do, with a quick look at the charts so that we can see what's going on in each of the major markets. Um, let's look at currencies first. Now, this is my favorite chart. This is the US dollar basket. Um, from a technical perspective, I drew in a few days ago, a week or two ago, this um, symmetrical triangle pattern. Now, the symmetrical triangle is usually a uh, continuation pattern. In this case, the trend has been upwards. So you would expect probably a break to the upwards. Now, look what happened here. We had a break to the downside here. Let me get the dates right. Um, we had a break to the downside here on the 19th of July, so last Friday. But since then, we've been going higher and now we've broken out to the upside. So um, I think that's a very positive signal there for the dollar. I think that that looks um, as though, well, let's wait and see. But um, as long as that break is sustained and it's been above there really solidly only today. So let's wait for maybe another day or two to see whether it's really genuine break. But I think that's a very positive signal for the dollar. Um, why? Well, it's hard to say, really. I mean, the only thing that's happened recently is that there seems to have been an agreement on the budget in the United States. Um, uh, and that, of course, would, would mean that there's no likelihood of the government shutting down and all that sort of thing. So um, I think that's more a technical move than a fundamental move. But still, the background does look pretty strong, I would say, for the dollar. Um, let's have a look at how that's reflected in the euro against the dollar, because after all, that basket is made up principally of euros. And there you can see a, a, a very sharp move downwards. So this is a move that, that mirrors that move in the dollar. Um, I think that means that broadly speaking, the market tone at the moment is risk off. So that means that people are prepared to go into uh, safe havens like the Japanese yen and the Swiss franc, and gold and US treasuries and German bonds, rather than for riskier um, assets such as well, such as the euro, as we're looking at this. Um, the other point about the euro here at the moment is perhaps not related so much to the dollar, but we have an ECB meeting on Thursday. The European Central Bank's Governing Council meets on Thursday. And there is a possibility that it will cut interest rates on Thursday by 10 basis points. I have to say, I think that's unlikely. I think the chances are very roughly two to one that the ECB will leave interest rates where they are. But there is an outside possibility, as I said, maybe a chance of Maybe the chances are three to one of being, rates being left unchanged, but there is nonetheless a significant possibility. Actually, no, come to think of it, it's probably two to one in favor of um, unchanged. Um, a, a probability of roughly a third, 33%, that uh, these people will cut rates. And I think it's more likely that they will cut rates at their September meeting. So it's against that background, I think, that the euro is going down, which um, is obviously important. Although, of course, it's worth mentioning that uh, we've got a Fed meeting coming up 
afterwards and that could change the picture still I would say strong dollar weak euro the kind of the main trends at the moment um, let's have a look at one or two of the others uh, let's have a look let's say at dollar yen and see what that's doing so dollar rising against the yen which does suggest to me that the dollar is the safe haven at the moment that people prefer um, as I said you normally think of currencies like the yen and the Swiss franc as being the main safe havens but well at the moment it looks like people prefer the dollar let's have a look while we're here at the dollar against the Swiss franc and see if that's the same and well it's pretty flat isn't it maybe a tiny upward move in the dollar over the last couple of days but still it's the dollar that's the currency of choice at the moment partly on its safe haven attributes right let's have a look at one or two other things um cable sterling against the dollar well the terrible looking pattern there um sterling still falling really quite steeply let's go back in time and you can see it's right back at these lows we saw in january and if you go back and back and back and back well you can see we were last at these levels back not all that long after the brexit referendum in 2017 so we were last lower than this all around here which is uh march 2017 so sterling looking really weak at the moment if the dollar is the currency of choice the sterling is definitely the currency that you really people don't like at the moment very weak um, we're about to get um, confirmation that Boris Johnson has been chosen as the leader of the UK Conservative Party and therefore will become the next UK Prime Minister um, I think most people were expecting the announcement to have happened by now but so far it hasn't so Johnson expected to be named Britain's next prime minister. Um, the result of the vote was expected probably about 20 minutes ago. Um, and so it's been delayed. I don't know whether that means that it's actually closer between Johnson and uh, Jeremy Hunt, who's his main rival, his only rival. Um, so I think this is perhaps a precautionary move ahead of that announcement. But if it comes while I'm on air, um, I'll certainly let you know. By the way, I should have said, if you can hear me, would you mind letting me know, please? Because I really don't want this to go out into the ether with nobody listening, <laughs> if you see what I mean. Um, so those are the main stories. Boris to become the next UK Prime Minister. Um, that brings the possibility of a no deal Brexit closer. Um, he has said that he will leave, the UK will leave the EU. Um, come what may do or die on October the 31st so that's I think pretty negative for the pound the pound really does not like the idea of no deal so that's why sterling I think is weak um, and you know with with people moving into currencies like the dollar that obviously adds to um, the, the dollar's strength and sterling's weakness um, Oh, right. Thank you very much for telling me you can hear me. Um, should we expect a temporary bullish run on GBP, says Stephen Reynolds? Well, you can never rule that out, can you? That's actually a very good point. Um, after this sort of decline, yes, you would expect a bit of a rally. Perhaps it's another um, uh, sell the rumor, buy the fact move. I hadn't really thought of that, but yes, it's a very good point. Sell the rumor, buy the fact. Boris becomes prime minister um, and uh, Sterling rallies because it's been oversold, possibly. But it doesn't show oversold on here. This is the RSI, which is um, a momentum indicator. It shows whether it's overbought or oversold. It's heading down towards that 30 mark, which would mean it's oversold. Um, it's not quite there yet, but as you say, an interesting one to bear in mind. Um, right, let's have a look. What currencies haven't we looked at so far? Um, I'm always asked on these webinars about the Kiwi so let's have a quick look at the Kiwi this is the New Zealand dollar um, it's been pretty strong hasn't it against the US dollar but just begin begun to move back downwards over the last four days so perhaps that's a bit of a a, um, a reaction after that strong move higher um, euro I've looked at um, the main uh, safe havens I've looked at Aussie yen now Aussie yen um, as you'll know is always a good indicator of where risk sentiment is 
Aussie is the one you buy when you're optimistic. The yen is the one you buy when you're less optimistic. And you can see it's pretty flat, which does show that we're still not far off neutral as far as sentiment is concerned. Although, as I've said already, I think that sentiment is actually moving. It's getting worse. Uh, let's have a look at the Aussie against the US dollar. Um, there you can see the Aussie going down, but that's clearly just US dollar strength. Um, the Canadian, I never seem to mention on these. So I'll have a quick look at that one as well. Um, this is the dollar rising against the Canadian dollar. So really everywhere you look, you've got exactly the same picture. It's all about dollar strength at the moment. Um, even though um, there are hopes that the Fed will cut interest rates when the FOMC next meets. Let's have a look at some of the other assets now. And uh, let's go for the other big safe haven, which is gold. And you see yet again the same signal, which is that people really prefer the dollar. Now, this is a little, um, I suppose it's a pennant, isn't it? You've got the long run up, then you've got this pennant um, continuation pattern. Break to the higher, to the hut, I can't speak today. Break to the upside, as you'd expect. So strong rise, pennant pattern, jump to the upside but look what's happened since then we've had four sessions now of the dollar of, of gold actually going back down again and the risk of repeating myself too many times I think that's yet again the, the demand for the dollar that's really causing that now the other interesting charts amongst the commodities is of course oil now this is not doing what you would expect it to do, is it? Look at this, it's gone down and down and down and down for about two weeks now. These are all daily charts I'm showing you, but let's have a look at something else. Let's have a look at, let's say the hourly chart. And I think on this, you can see how much oil has gone down. Let's bring it in here. So this is the July the 11th. So a couple of weeks ago, and you can see here the price of oil going down and down and down, although it has, I suppose, stabilized uh, today. Now, the reason that's, I think, rather strange is, of course, because we've ramped up tensions between Iran and the West. Now, the, the a, a British ship's been towed into or directed into Iran by the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. Tensions are very high in uh, between the West and Iran. There's the US being belligerent about Iran, Iran being belligerent about the US, the UK becoming involved. You might think that that's all very positive for oil, and yet the oil price has gone down. I think that's probably a matter of supply more than anything. Um, yes, Iranian supplies are down, but I think the US is now such a big oil producer that it's able to um, it's able to make up for any shortages. So however much supplies from the Middle East are disrupted, I think that the US um, shale industry is now able to make up that shortfall. And perhaps that's why oil the oil price isn't moving in the way that you'd expect. Although I guess it's also positive that also possible that all that bad news was in the market already. Anyway, I think that's quite surprising. So this is the um, US crude contract, WTI, West Texas Intermediate. This is the Brent. So this is um, the European benchmark, in fact, the global benchmark, Brent crude. And here again, you can see this long decline here, although it has actually stabilized recently. So this has stabilized in a way that the US crude hasn't. Let's have a look on that on the one hour chart and see what that shows. So um, here's the drift downwards here from what's the date here? This is the uh, 16th, Tuesday the 16th. Let me go back to it. Yeah, Tuesday the 16th falls but then a lot of some stability really i think that's the best way to put it some stability over the course of uh, uh friday monday and into tuesday um so that's i think relatively positive in the same way as, as us crude um where should we go to next let's have a look at stocks next and see what sentiment is like in the stock market and it's still broadly positive this is Wall Street. Uh, this is the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Um, 
relatively flat. I mean, no great moves higher here, um, which again tells me that the move is the sentiment generally, the move is more about dollar strength than about overall risk off sentiment. So sentiment on Wall Street is still okay. Um, and the S&P 500, where is that? That's here. Um, looking pretty firm as well. Turning to Europe, we've got the FTSE 100. I say this every week, but this is really an international index of London listed stocks, banks, and um, mining companies and so on that are internationally based. Same sort of picture really here, um, flat over the last few weeks, but um, uh, certainly not negative by any sense. The other major stock markets, France, stable, Germany, uh, interesting, slightly different there, down and then back up again, so slightly different there. Spain, flat, Spain also I think picking a new leader. Italy, uh, more volatile here with that big drop downwards, but then a bit of a rally since. So that's all the major markets. Oh, no, it's not. I always get asked about Bitcoin. So let's have a look at Bitcoin and see what that says. Well, extraordinarily volatile, I think is the best way to put it. So we've had this huge run up that you, I'm sure you all know about if you're interested in Bitcoin, the high here over 13,000, nearly $14,000 for a Bitcoin. Um, we're now down below $10,000, just dropped below $10,000 could fall further, possibly. Um, I suppose you could call that a sort of rounding top, I guess. Um, but so volatile, I think it's really difficult to say where Bitcoin is going. Um, still, there you go, for what it's worth, below 10,000 now, so looking a little bit weak. Now, let's go and see what's on the calendar over the next seven days, or rather the rest of this week. And um, we'll start with our calendar, the economic calendar. So this is what's happened, ha happened yesterday and is going on this week. So I will go from today to yesterday and see what we had. Um, not much. Um, the Chicago Fed, which I think came out at 12.30 my time. Um, yeah, US, yeah, the Chicago Fed National Activity Index. Now, for those of you who haven't been here before, I should explain. When I'm looking at sentiment indicators, I'm not just looking at market sentiment. I'm also looking at consumer sentiment, business sentiment, industrial sentiment, everything that might give us a clue as to what's likely to happen next. The hard data, obviously the most important market movers, but they tell us what's already happened. These um, confidence indicators give us an idea of what's likely to happen in the future and that's why I think they're worth concentrating on. So this is the Chicago Fed, all the Fed, all the, the Federal Reserve banks uh, produce these sorts of indexes. This is Chicago but it's a national activity index. It was expected to rise, it actually well, it, what, it did rise a, a tiny tad, but it didn't go back into positive territory. Now, with always these things, don't worry about the actual numbers. What 0 0.02 means is neither here nor there. What matters is the direction. From minus 0 0.03, it was expected to rise to plus 0 0.08. In fact, it only rose to minus 0 0.02. So that would suggest weak-ish growth in America, and that, I guess, gives another reason why the Fed should at some point cut interest rates. But these are very small number. I mean, very small changes. I wouldn't worry too much about them. Today, um, several things happening today. I think um, let's go on here and look up the. So two o'clock my time, two o'clock London time. You've got the Richmond Fed Manufacturing Index. Same applies. Don't worry about the number, and it's not really a market mover anyway. This I think is more interesting. At the same time, eurozone consumer confidence. I think that is potentially a market mover. It's expected unchanged, but well, would you be surprised if it fell a bit further? I, I don't think I would. Um, and then we can start getting the PMIs. PMIs, purchasing managers indexes, calculated for 
manufacturing sector, services sector, construction sector. These really are market movers. So you get the purchasing managers indexes. Purchasing managers simply the people who buy stuff for companies. They tell you where they think things are, how they think business is, and um, the company that produces these gives you um, its own index, which is quite well related with um, uh, GDP, economic growth. Now, Australia kicks things off. Um, so this is late my time on um, Tuesday, which is Wednesday morning in Australia. We get that. We haven't got um, predictions for that one. So let's wait and see. Let's go on till to Wednesday tomorrow. So then we get the next PMI. This is from Japan. So that's again Wednesday. Um, to get the J Japanese manufacturing PMI. Um, and then we get all the European ones all coming in a flood. So we get France, then we get Germany, then we get the Eurozone as a whole. Um, and these are supposed to get manufacturing and services and a composite a composite of the two. France tends not to be too market moving, Germany does. Um, and here you can see, oh, well, well, actually it's mixed, isn't it? There's a small increase expected in manufacturing, a small decrease expected in services, and therefore the composite, well, a little bit down. Eurozone as a whole, unchanged manufacturing, a little bit lower for services and a little bit lower for the composite. So that's what's expected. Um, it all depends, I suppose, on um, how, what am I trying to say? I think I'm trying to say that these are important market moving indexes. Let's see how they compare with expectations. Um, don't worry too much about the French one. The German one important because it gives you an indication of what the Eurozone as a whole will be because Germany, of course, is the largest um, Eurozone economy. And then 1345, my time, you get the US manufacturing PMI and services PMI, um, both expected a wee bit higher. Um, these unusually are not as important because there is a longer running series called the ISM, the Institute for Supply Management. And they're the one that, that those are the indicators that people look at rather than the US uh, PMIs. But still, as I said, for what it's worth, these are both expected a bit higher. Thursday. Um, do, 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 Thursday. There we go. Um, probably the most important sentiment indicator for Europe. This is the German IFO or IFO Business Climate Index. Very important for the Euro, very important for European business. So this German institute um, produces its business climate index. It's very closely watched. Um, I think it's a high impact figure, but if you want to call it medium, so be it. But anyway, it's expected lower. Um, also take a look at two of these other ind indexes that IFO produces, um, the expectations index, which obviously is forward looking, and the current assessment, which is slightly less important. So all of those, I think, well worth looking out for on Thursday. The main, for me, the main figures of the week, are PMIs and IFO. Another Federal Reserve Bank, 1500, Kansas City Fed's Manufacturing Activity Index, expected a wee bit higher. And then finally, Friday, 26th of July, um, at early in the morning, our time, 0800, you get the ECB survey of professional forecasters. You'd think that that would be a big market mover. It actually tends not to be. So this is the ECB surveying what professional forecasters think of think the outlook is for the Eurozone economy. Um, so that's it, really. That's um, the, the main charts, what's going on at the moment, and the um, what's coming up on the calendar. Now, at this point, I tend to look at the um, fear and greed index, beautifully named. So what emotion is driving the market now, asks CNN Business, which produces these numbers. And the answer is fear. And what that means, well, what it means is that 50, the market is neutral here between the orange and the green. Um, if it goes down to zero, it means extreme fear, which means everybody's rushing into safe havens. If it goes up to 100, it's extreme greed, which means that people are going for the, um, the most uh, active 
numbers, assets such as stocks and so forth. Um, 44, which is in fear territory, but only just. Uh, a week ago, though, it was in greed territory. So look at that. It's fallen by 13 points uh, over the course of the last week, which is, I think, quite impressive. 44 today, 44 yesterday, a week ago, 57. So it has more has moved quite a bit lower. Um, I'm not quite sure why. I can't see any particular reason why the market should have come off in that sort of way, why suddenly people should be looking for safe havens. And as we've already discussed, really, they're only looking at the dollar. But anyway, stocks are quite strong still. So doesn't I, I'm surprised at that. I think market is more sort of neutral at the moment, but just head it up simply because stocks are steady. But there you go. Um, yeah, that's what that says. Let's go back onto our home page. Ah, um, I think they have announced uh, the uh, appointment of Boris Johnson, although I can't actually see the headline. Um, it says, the headline that I'm reading, Boris Johnson is set to avoid an immediate no confidence vote in his new com government as Jeremy Corbyn waits for a better chance to topple him after the summer. And the source of that is HuffPost UK, Huffington Post UK. So um, I suppose that's positive for Sterling, um, if he'll avoid an immediate no confidence vote in his new government. Um, Jeremy Corbyn, who's the leader of the opposition Labour Party, waiting for a better chance to topple him after the summer, that uh, says Huffington Post. Let's have a quick whiz back to Sterling and see if it's reacted that. So where were we? We were in cryptos, weren't we? So let's go back to currencies and to Sterling. We're Sterling here. And well, it's still heading lower, which I think that doesn't look very much different from uh, the last time that uh, we were here. Now, where was I? Yeah, on our website, that's where. So let's go back to the top of the page and to our home page. And um, uh, let's see where our sentiment index is set. So um, sentiment. Uh, DaleFX is a subsidiary of IG. IG allows people to trade using their platform. We look at which people are long and which people, uh, sorry, how many people are long and how many people are short of these various assets. Um, we calculate them, obviously not individuals, don't look at individuals' positions. We just look at them all aggregated and we work out whether the market or retail traders who use this platform are long or short. And we then take a contrarian view. What does that tell us? Well, it gives us a bullish signal on the euro suggesting that the dollar could actually be could be time for the dollar to react a wee bit lower still another bearish signal on sterling bearish on dollar yen so that's interesting so um bullish on the euro against the dollar implies perhaps we might see a bit of dollar weakness coming up and dollar yen the same bearish so again a little bit of dollar weakness coming up but sterling still bearish Gold mixed, Bitcoin bearish. These signals are almost always Bitcoin bearish, I find. So um, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure you should rely on that one. That's a bit surprising to me. And then bearish um, S&P 500 on that one. Um, if you want to know more, then go up here where it says sign up, login, daily FX plus. Then go into here where it says IG client sentiment. And there you will see reports filed once or twice a day by um, what my colleagues, perhaps by me. And you can see much more detail there. We haven't got one up today yet. This is one that was published yesterday by David Rodriguez, my one of my colleagues in New York. And you can see here what's going on. And here you look at big moves. Um, and here you can see the biggest move here is in spot silver, where you've seen a big weekly, a big rise in shorts. So that's perhaps the the, the one to look out for. You can see here that this gives you a quite an interesting, actually, while we're here, I will just do a quick search for um, silver and see what it says. There we go. Um, so it says that um, retail trader data show almost 90% of traders are net long. Extraordinary. Almost 90% of traders are net long silver. Very strange there. Um, 
So uh, the number of traders net short, look at this, is 100, 107% higher from last week. Wow. And so anyway, not surprisingly, you get a spot silver bearish contrarian trading bias. If you want to know more, I will go back to our homepage and go to our education section. If you want to know more, please have a look at our Forex University at our free trading guides and so on, because they are really, really helpful. I got another of those emails the other day saying, oh, I've lost all my money. Can you help me? I've got, you know, Tuppence Hakeney left. What can I do with it? And the answer is, please don't trade unless you know what you're doing, because if you don't know what you're doing, you will lose money. Here, there's lots and lots of education material. Please read it before you trade. If you want to open a demo account, you can at IG. I think opening a demo account is a good idea. So you can see, well, am I getting this right or not without actually losing any money? And well, I'm, oh, I'm over my half hour as usual. Apologies for that. I hope you found this useful. Um, please join me again next week when hopefully we shall be back on air with more on market sentiment. Goodbye for now.